The novel No Longer Human by Osamu Dazai is a strange book to experience. The book can perfectly mirror the deepest thoughts that we have on a day-to-day -day basis and just leave you with a gut punch. But the real question is what makes this book so special that it's the second best-selling novel of all time in Japan? It was written at a time of extreme change. Many Japanese individuals wondered what was going to happen to their country and translated into English at a time where tensions were at an all-time high. However, the book found the perfect time to enter into the consciousness of the people reading it, where people felt seen and a level that they had never been seen before. The book is structured a bit like a sandwich. In the middle of the sandwich, there's our main character, a narrator, Yozo Oba, a man who's haunted by society. He's enigmatic, he's alienated, he's crass and self-interested, but we have incredible sympathy for him. We laugh with him and literally grow with him from childhood through adult, and we read three memorandums of him that explores his life, his choices, and his struggles. Now, the outer bread of this sandwich, the opening and closing of this book, is a completely separate speaker. Someone who has found these memorandums and pictures of the main character, Yozo, and expresses an external reaction on him, the way many of us readers do on people we know very little about. Do the details of this person's life change our views, our sympathy for a person? Are we drawn to someone who's hurting, or do we cast them away? I gotta level with you. I love this novel, and I'm really excited to share this project with you today. We're gonna explore this novel, and it's a bit like a mirror in terms of how the novel is structured, which maybe sounded better in my head, but I gotta admit I'm a little cringe at it right now. But it's too late. We're going to have three main sections of this video. There's the first memorandum, which is the individual and the relationship with society. People have an incredible influence on each other. And this is going to be a focused discussion between my best friend, Crypto, and myself. And we're just going to talk about these characters and how they represent a repressed aspect of society for Yozo. In the second memorandum, the second part of this video, we're going to talk about the mind of Yozo. And this is where we sat down with a licensed mental health therapist and took a fictionalized character and applied therapeutical practices to him. We thought it'd be interesting to see what they sense, what they feel, what they imagine, and the way that this is a novel that blends a character with a real-life author's experiences, that it's a unique opportunity to perhaps have a different look at what it means to be a person in the world. And in the third memorandum, we're going to have a discussion with our friend Jack, who's read literature from Japan for over 20 years. We're going to explore the autobiographical elements of this novel, the I novel in general, as well as the philosophy of Yozo, his pessimism, his nihilism, his idealized self, the imposter syndrome, and a lot more. So saying that I'm excited is an understatement, because this is one of those novels, and I hope I'm not alone when I'm talking to you, the viewer right now that this is one of the first times I had ever felt truly seen in a novel, but at the same time perplexed at the differences between the main character and myself. If you're someone who wants to explore one of Japan's greatest novels and really just share the love and interest in this character, let's get started. The relation between individual and society is very close. Essentially, society is the regularities, customs, and ground rules of anti-human behavior. From F.M. Anayat Hosayan in Relation Between Individual and Society. And I already have so many questions <laughs> when it comes to this quote. Uh, what is anti-human behavior is probably where we need to start. <laughs> anti-human so not doing the norm i guess would be a way to say it <laughs> we need to realize and recognize there's a snuck assumption in this statement and 
that the fact that we're bouncing the individual off society, we are not saying society is a fixed concept, that society, its Mm. standards, its expectations, the way it reacts to things is a changing thing. And as a result, since society must change, therefore, too, we assume the individual must change as well. And then what happens if the individual doesn't change or doesn't know how to adapt as it is changing right in front of them or around them. I think when we talk about this, we, we have to accept the humility that there is a mirroring aspect when it comes to the self and the society, right? The, the, this this relationship, because as babies, I mean, research has shown the way that you make faces to them and play with them. They start to mimic what you do, Right. The, this, that, that old ad in them that be careful what you do in front of your kids because they're going to repeat it, right? There's, there's something about belonging and the, the recognition, even as a young child, of, of someone else and yourself and how you interact with them. And we can see that even in uh, an interesting comparison would be perhaps even just like when you think about bands, right? Like when you think about like the metalhead scene, you've got people in black shirts, uh, hoodies, even tattoos, certain hairstyles. And that's not to say that, you know, there can't be plain clothes person because I am the metal head that, that has the plain clothes, right? Like I, <laughs> I belong to that group, but we still like, you know, when you're at a show and there's like the head banging, like there's certain things that you do to mimic or react with other people to show that you belong. I've always thought of myself that way too, is when you're in a certain situation and people look at you and judge you and be like, no, no, no. I'm one of you. You just don't know it because I don't dress that way or I don't speak that way. Uh, you know, it, it, it being a nerd, right? When, you know, because if I'm dressed really nice and I'm in a suit and everything, be like, no, no, I'm super nerdy. I'm very awkward. I don't do well in social situations. <laughs> you know, like this is not me. I look yeah. put together, but I'm really not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the you clean up real well is, is what I hear sometimes. <laughs> Exactly. (laughs) So when we talk about Dazai, the writer, and the way that he's mimicked so well in this novel with Yozo on some levels, but we see even him as an author, he had these two. One of the authors that he absolutely venerated was Ryunosuke Akutagawa. And when Akutagawa took on the self-annihilation and kind of ended himself, it it basically what Yozo went through in the downfall of his own life of just like, you know, the drugs, the debauchery, that sort of thing. That's kind of what Desai the writer went through as well. It's, it's almost like the way that some people have this self-destructive behavior. Desai also took on himself in the same way that he reflects and you see, you see waves of in, in the mirror with Yozo. I think there's two things. I think with Desai, is he, is he truly mimicking something that Akutagawa did? Uh, you know, may his mentor, does he feel that this is the path that you should be going on? And I also think about, and I don't know, uh, I also think about, are these coping mechanisms? Was there more to this man, obviously, that he, it just coincidence that his life unfolds the same as well because they come from similar societies, similar backgrounds, does it seem to just happen in the same fashion? No, I think you hit the nail on the head there because it's these abnormal circumstances that have sometimes abnormal responses is the one way to look at it. That's where we start to see kind of the origination of mental illness. It's it's the self reflecting back from society where we start to see these these ideas of lesser than, of depression, of anxiety. And I kind of want to explore that today because, you know, we talk about this novel, No Longer Human in English, right? But when you look at the actual Japanese words, Ningen Shikaku, there's a famous, you know, introduction here by Donald Keene that talks about the, the better translation of that is disqualified from being a human being, right? Because if you look at those those last two, the you have the shitsu and the kaku that kind of get combined to shikaku, and that basically means you're not qualified. You haven't achieved this rank. That second kanji actually means 
rank, capacity, character, and the first one means mistake, loss. You've, you've failed to achieve something, right? And that first part is ningen, right? Where the first kanji is jin, which means person, and the second kanji is space between things. And that's a little bit strange. Like, why does people combined with space between things mean you know, people, society, that sort of things. And it's kind of one of those things that there's a distance between people. And eventually over time, that just came to mean people. It came to mean like a society. And it's that relationship between people that I think is really what defines Yozo as a one of the most unique literary characters to have ever been created. I also think that the lack of society in his life as well makes him so unique because you talked about mental illness a little bit ago as well, and that in-betweenness, there is that distance, that, that more than just social distancing, which all of us in modern times are oh so aware of, but there is that, that distance between us as peoples. And I think that someone like Yozo, in the story, he has distanced himself maybe artificially from all the groups of society, and does that maybe cause some of his mental illness? Would that mental illness of his, whatever it may be, does that exist without society? That's exactly how you have to parse out Yozo, at least logically for me. Because when we say the word society, right, there's there's first multiple levels of society, the space between Agreed. people. Let's start with the biggest level of just society as a whole, the amorphous blob that just changes, right? <laughs> we use bridges to cross the street. We use pillowcases because it's easier to wash the pillowcase as opposed to the whole pillow. And Yozo is a, you know, he likes the bridges. He likes the pillowcases. But as soon as he finds out there's a utilitarian purpose, to quote the Donald Keene translation, He's disgusted with him. He's pulled back from it because I, I think there's an element that Yozo is rejecting his participation in society as a whole. So it brings me to my next point then. If he's rejecting that, but being a part of it has caused this mental illness, but rejecting it has also maybe caused part of his mental illness, would isolation, quote, cure him? Would that be something that would help him or hurt him even further? Has the minimal amount of interaction that he's had in society sustained him just enough to be where he is now? Yeah. So Emile Durkham, I'm not sure if I'm saying that name correctly. She has this wonderful paper that writes up kind of about deviance, which, you know, do we consider Yoko a deviant? But devi deviants are a form by by rebelling against society. You're further establishing the boundaries of society right? By further bringing the other people that say these are the norms, these are the things that we agree to, the people that break the rules and push that further strengthen the actual form of society. So in a sense, Yozo as a character, as a person, is almost necessary to reestablish what are the things that we agree upon. And by him pushing back on society, it further, he, he's participating in the creation of it and also participating in his own suffering. And I think it's that, you know, when you look at it, and we're going to go more into this in our third part of this, the, with the discussion with Jack, the, the nihilism, the aspect of, of dukkha, the idea of justifying that life is suffering. I think that it is necessary for someone like Yozo, who his standards of pushing out on society, because then that's what justifies his suffering. He doesn't push too hard, though, sometimes, I feel. Sometimes he, he embraces society just fine with his, uh, you know, prostituting and drinking and debaucheries. Uh, he has no, no problem. And a few times he does find quippets of happiness, and he recognizes that this is maybe why people do these things. He doesn't quite understand them himself or why he's doing them, but he understands why other people are doing them. Let's let's start at the beginning, right? So when we're first born, a couple months old, we've already talked about how there's research that shows that there's there's connection with your family, right, in terms of how you mimic them, how they teach you. We've talked about how if you put a child in front of a TV, for two years, will they learn to speak? And shockingly, the answer is no. 
you have to have that interaction, that feedback system to really participate and understand uh, human beings in a sense, right? So for Yozo, when he's young in a family, which is again, something that is our first form of a society, it's our first group that we belong to that we don't even get to choose. What was Yozo's experience like? Because I almost got this feeling that he was just invisible almost to his dad and to his family members. To take your an analogy of learning language, it's got to be a two-way street, and Yozo's early life is a one-way street. He is a part of a very large family, so he's kind of forgotten in the back, and he has probably a poor relationship or a strained relationship with his father where he doesn't know how to interact with him. And then the only way that he eventually gains notoriety is being the 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 class clown to being the goofball in the family. And that becomes his role. And he says, hey, it's better than nothing. So he gives it his 110%. This is what he dedicates his life to being. And that's who he becomes known as forever for better or worse. And I think in Yozo's mind, it's for the worse because it doesn't feel like it's his true self. Yeah. And as he gets older, the classmates call him out on being rich. Like, I think they call him lucky at one point because the idea is that you should be afforded greater things coming from wealth. Right. But the way that his father bought off things like his love almost even, and you know, Flatfish was a family friend. So do we consider him a part of that society? I don't know. But even him, he was kind of a financial backer in a sense. I think he did care about Yozo, but it's it's the usage of money as opposed to the usage of empathy and connection. And I think that's why Yozo felt the need to destroy his connection with money. He needed enough to survive, like don't get me wrong, but he would burn through that for the hedonistic pleasures of life because he associated that with his connection with his family at some levels, I think. I like how you brought up the point of connection. I think modern times, if we look at Yozo and his family and we think about their relationship and their connections, we would say that perhaps Yozo needed a different form of affection or love uh, because there are different love languages. There are different ways that you interact that make you feel good or make you feel appreciated or make you feel loved, whatever that word means to you. And for Yozo, money was not that. Yozo, I think, needed something more compassionate, maybe more physical-based. You know, he just needed a hug. Uh, I know that sounds cheesy, but maybe it's true here. And his father only knew how to express his love or his affection by buying things. And that's how a lot of people are. You know, I love my wife. I go buy her something, uh, you know, or write her a love note. She loves me. She makes me a sandwich, you know, or, uh, you know, gives me a back rub. (laughs) There's all different kinds of ways that we can we can have those human connections. And the problem here is that the father and Yozo never talk about how they both are interacting with one another. And that's where the connection becomes frayed and leads Yozo into his life that he lives probably what I would interpret as pretty unhappily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, he never, throughout this whole novel, you never hear the word depressed. I don't think you hear the word anxiety. This is, this is published at a time when it, before it was cool to talk about mental illness or acceptable to talk about mental illness. That's when this book was published. And I think that's why when you hand this book to to people, sometimes there's there's certain groups of people that just feel seen, right? Like like they can associate with that that inferiority or that lack of connection or that desire maybe that Yozo might have had. And you know when you look at the school section here, how he connected with uh, school is kind of like the next section of society, right? So if we're born and forced into a family for most of us. Next, we're kind of forced or brought into a school. And that's like the next level of, you know, who you hang out with, the cliques, is detrimental to your persona in school, right? Like you almost you almost want to be accepted by the cool kids, like the kids that had, I don't know, like the car that could actually get you places and stuff like that. Like you almost would compromise yourself in order to fit into those groups, right? And Yozo, I think it's very interesting the way that he uses his mask and is very honest with his usage of the mask to to get laughter, to get connection with schoolmates, which I think is something that we all do on some level. But it's when Takechi calls him out on it, says, you did that on mm. purpose. It's, it's the fact that he's now like it's 
his mask is gone. His facade is gone. And if that's gone, he's going to see the real him, right? And what do you think Yozo's afraid of here? Oh, okay. Uh, I will address that. Don't let me forget, but there's so much to unpack here. So we've been talking about the societal norms, and then so you had your family societal norms, and now you have this norm, and now you have a new set of rules that are being introduced. You have school rules, and they do have the cliques, and they do have certain ways you're supposed to behave and who you're supposed to talk to and who you're not allowed to talk to. There, There's all these unspokens uh, that you have to learn, and I think that's tough for Yozo because he doesn't know how to learn those. He's never really been taught those because he comes from such a large family. And then you also brought up the point of the cool kids, how we want to fit into this new segregated society within society because it's the school having its own set of unique rules you brought up the point of the cool kid is the kid with the cool car and then it brings it back to what you said before material possessions are those that identify the cool kids uh now when i was growing up it was not a cool car uh but interesting that you brought that up so to to, to the final point of i don't know <laughs> Well, there's just so much to discuss here because when it comes to how how we as the self reflect off the society of school, when you and I were growing up, we did not have immediate feedback, I'll say. So we grew up pre, <laughs> pre-social media. That was not a thing when we were in, in high school. Come on, such. internet wasn't a thing when we were growing up. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're old men here. But now... <laughs> When you look at how students get immediate feedback, like in terms of Instagram, in terms of the photos that they post and how many likes and comments that they get, and Twitter, the way that that's kind of a storm of something else, I'll say that, Ooh. you have immediate feedback of how much you're accepted by this this blob of society, which groups your you're in. Yeah. yeah. And it's it can be it can be reaffirming for some. Or devastating it, for others. And it can be earth shattering, world shattering for others. Like we're talking about how from the 90s, I want to say that like mental illness classifications have increased by 50%. If we've got better food standards, better medical standards, are we classifying, over classifying mental illness? Or are we lacking connection and getting over, over fed too much information about where we don't belong? And is that kind of what Yozo's going through, where he's trying to avoid that information? And when he gets to, uh, you know, after Tekechi, he gets to Horiki, and Horiki introduces him to the drugs, to the prostitutes. All these things that when you look at what they do, there's a couple different ways to look at it. Some do them to, to feel life more, to get that excitement. Some do it to dull life. And if we go back to my theory of Yozo's earlier about his dukkha, his, his life is suffering, he does this to dull life because he's he's not really sure what the point of it is other than that he doesn't agree with what society defines as the point. Hmm, okay. I think that might be the first time we actually disagree upon something because I felt like he was just doing it to try to feel something. He never felt loved. He never felt accepted by his classmates. He never felt uh, uh, rewarded for his artwork. He was always just the class clown, and he didn't want to be that, but he had to be that in so many avenues of his life. And now he has the opportunity to try something new that could help him feel something for the first time. And I think that's why he's trying these different avenues of life is, is experimentation like so many people do in their you know 20s, college years of trying to find myself and trying to find feelings that I didn't know were there uh, or were never recognized because you know, a broken relationship with your parents who are, again, the very first people that you have that, you know, societal relationship with, if it's not there, it's not good. Uh, how do you function in the rest of society? And I, Yozo can't. So he's, he's grasping at straws at, at anything in order to just try to feel some semblance of normalcy that he thinks everybody else has nailed down. Which again, we're all just kind of lying, I and mean, we're all wearing masks. Nobody really has it figured out, but Yozo doesn't know that. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I do agree that there was a feeling of of transition with that. Like it was when he took on that part of his life, 
the way that even Desai, the way that when he kind of ran away with a geisha and was uh, kind of excommunicated from his family, the, the same way that Yozo went through a similar experience of it was a society that he didn't even belong with per se or get along with the best, but to still, you know, reject it by going after this deviant kind of like lifestyle, I def it definitely felt like a gateway, like a way to move forward yeah. in life, right? And to me, the it, have you ever heard the term ikigai before? No. <laughs> it it's a Japanese term. I wouldn't expect it, but it, there's there's even books written on it. But if you look up who are the longest living humans on Earth, it's actually this island, Okinawans, the area. Of Japan. Yeah, Okinawa. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. I did know. Okay, that I did yeah. know. They lived like 110, 120 consistently. Yeah, and there's so there's this theory about ikigai, like the the, the purpose of life. Okay. And if you draw these four circles, okay, you've got what you love to do. And that and that could be your job. It could be just when you come home and talk to your wife. It, it, you have to define what are the things that that give you pleasure. On the bottom you have what you can be paid for, right? Mm. The idea is that you what you love to do, ideally you want to be paid for, right? To make a living, to give purpose because also if you think about it, there's well, there's what you love is an intrinsic thing. You don't need anyone else to validate what you love. Like you can make that decision yourself. But on the bottom, what you get paid for, that means other people want want you to do that for some reason. Either there's not enough people doing it, it's a valuable service, there's tons of theories for economics as to why things exist. But being paid for it is a form of external validation. You can almost view them as opposites of each other. And then on one side, you also have what the world needs right? The fact that other people want it is also external validation. The fact that they're going to pay you for it is a way for you to see that validation. And then the far left is what you're good at. So if you're good at it and you know it's what you love to do and the world needs it and the world's willing to pay you for it, ikigai, call, like the ikigai is the purpose of life. That's, that's what your, your way of fo forward is. Because then you can live longer, healthier lives in this Okinawan ways. I know I just went off on a long tangent there. The, po <laughs> the point being, though, I think when we look at Yozo, right, and when we look at how he views society defines this purpose, this utilitarian reason for a bridge or a pillowcase, or when students can see the real me, there's something about the way that when his self, like, collides with external validation that there's, it's almost like two magnets that as soon as you put it together, Yozo is going to go flying off in some other destructive manner, like, like a, like a, a magnetic force being repelled where he's going to go destroy something because he doesn't, he doesn't want to create that in some levels. Yeah. But when I think about it and your Ikigai makes perfect sense now. And I think about Yozo and these, the, the reason for being is he doesn't know what his reason is and he seems to be bouncing between the circles that you mentioned and i think that sometimes he gets stuck in between the circles and that's where his anxiety his depression his fears all come from is he doesn't even have one of them let alone two or three to have that quote perfect happy life to live you know long and prosper he doesn't have any of that he just seems to be moving consistently just searching and searching and it's very heartbreaking and i think that's why again uh, we talk about this more later uh, in our talk with jack why this story is so relatable is so many of us can recognize always chasing after that kind of dream or chasing after you know that that happiness in order to fill some of those voids in our lives whether that be relationship money job or whatever did you know that there are actually statistics out there that during like economic downturns, like when people are theoretically sadder or feeling more disconnected from their purpose in life, there's actually an uptick in people writing about this novel. There's something about this novel for people who have lost perhaps their, their ability to be seen or feel seen and reading this novel and recognizing some of that loneliness and anxiety and depression that we may have in ourselves. Yeah, oh, uh, I, I'm there with them. Uh, I mean, we're literally making videos on this uh, during one of the craziest time periods of modern history with the pandemic and depressions and all the things that are going on in the world today. So yeah, it, it fits.
So let's do one last circle around to the closest Yozo has at, at being happy. And, and you brought up kind of like the, the relationships, right? Which, you know, which is probably the smallest form of society that we have, but is also the one that we define the most, right? You don't typically define your family. You don't typically define your school. A lot of that's set by geographical reasons, class reasons, where you're born, things like that. But when it comes to who you decide to date or marry, there's usually a, typically a lot more control on that. And, you know, the first woman, Suneko, might be the only woman that he found happiness with, maybe the only woman that he's loved. There's something to be said about how he tried to get into a rhythm, a, a way of life with her. But the fact that it revolved around the fact that she too suffered, she too had a lot of dukkha in her life, like there, that life was suffering, that there was that mimicry almost in that relationship to our earlier point, that the fact that they also saw the same suffering in life was one of the first times that I think he felt seen or even reflected in another human being. This is another part of the story they think a lot of people can relate to is when we start forming our relationships, there is the idea opposites attract, but there's the there the opposites come together, yes, but there is same comes together with same. And then that's just a recipe for ultimate disaster as you have this destructive person meeting this destructive person and they are equally bad for one another and it's hard for them to recognize is not necessarily they bring out the worst in one another, but they definitely aren't uplifting to one another, trying to better themselves and each other together. Uh, and in relationships, they usually talk about, you know, people are going to be, uh, you know, independent. It's like an H where you're supporting one another, but you have independent lives. There are people that, you know, are uh, codependent, um, like an A or, um, you know, not dependent at all, like a V. And I don't know what letter I would give uh, this couple as it just, it's, it's heartbreaking how they can't find happiness but they can't be together, but they cannot not be together either. <laughs> well, needless to say, it's, it's, it's this failure to connect at almost all the major levels of society in terms of the society as a whole, family, friends at school, lovers, like on all different levels, we see how Yozo can experience pain. And yeah. the way that there's no judgment passed upon it, life isn't some game where you're you're doing something wrong. I think a lot of the times, but but I think sometimes people feel this this guilt and this blame upon themselves when we can see how easy it is to stumble into these feelings of inferiority, these feelings of not being seen, and these fears of being associated or connected with things. It's it's something magical about the way that the self reflects off society and how it's never a perfect picture. And Yozo's complete failure across the board allows us to see that we're not alone. And that is a perfect transition into our second memorandum in the mind of Yozo. The mind of Yozo. Today, we wanted to take a unique approach to no longer human and apply modern therapy diagnosed tools to Yozo and present a diagnosis based on behaviors, thoughts, and stories described in the book. Upon first impressions of Yozo, a therapist may note the way in which Yozo experiences the world around him and begin identifying if Yozo is on the autism spectrum. The therapist would note the difficulty he has in reading social cues, facial cues, body language, in particular in conversations, and his difficulty with eye contact. The therapist may also identify Yozo's difficulty in empathizing with other people's thoughts and feelings, as well as his behaviors around food intake. One could hypothesize if his chronic illness as a child was due to malnutrition from avoidant, restrictive food intake, as this was in the 1940s as he was part of a very large family. Yozo's issue with food may have gone unnoticed. A diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder is not clinically significant in of itself, as ASD is not a mental illness, as some people inappropriately call it. It is a developmental condition that alters how we see the world and interact with people. 
but this would not be something the therapist would necessarily focus on. It would just be an observation and noted in our effort to best observe Yozo when formulating a treatment protocol. The therapist would be much more interested in the clinically significant symptoms Yozo is experiencing. This is where the real treatment of Yozo would lie. The therapist would be much more interested in the severe anxiety Yozo presents within any and all interactions he encounters with all individuals in the novel, as well as the marketed trauma symptoms that are evident. Yozo's anxiety begins in early childhood, where there an incongruence between his real self and ideal self. This led to an inner conflict and alienation within himself. Yozo cannot fully immerse himself in the social contracts of his family nor school setting due to his seemingly increasing chronic illness. The book illustrates examples of Yozo's excessively wanting to please other people, many times at the sake of his own mental health. He learns to mimic social constructs he believes others will find acceptable, realizing that he's been the, quote, clown elicits approval from his father, family, and schoolmates. Yozo feels he must be who his father wants him to be in order to be accepted and or loved by him. Yozo ultimately alienates himself even more, effectively hiding what he calls his, quote, real self, and guaranteeing that nobody will ever be able to genuinely connect with him. Since he learns to effectively hide himself, he never meaningfully assimilates into society and drives him to behave in ways that only exacerbate his feelings of alienation, such as the drinking, prostitution, and so on. There are several possible diagnoses consistent with Yozo's experience. With the limited information we have about him, here we will review possible diagnoses that a therapist could recognize in a patient like Yozo. The first we will review is Severe Social Anxiety Disorder, Avoidant Personality Disorder. Yozo experiences marked fear and anxiety about social situations in which he feels he could be exposed to possibly scrutiny by others. Examples include any social interaction Yozo has, like when he's having conversations, meeting unfamiliar people in the restaurants, or being observed or in normal activities like eating and drinking. The social situations almost always provoke fear and anxiety in Yozo. The fear and anxiety is out of proportion due to the actual threat posed by social situations and social cultural context. Yozo avoids occupational activities that involve significant interpersonal connection because of these fears of criticism, disapproval, or even rejection. He is unwilling to get involved with people unless certain of being liked by others. He shows restraint within intimate relationships because of the fear of being shamed or ridiculed. He is preoccupied with being criticized or rejected in social situations, as we see in many of the restaurants, and with his classmates. Yozo is inhibited in a new interpersonal situation because of feelings of inadequacy. He has personal views of social ineptitude, personal unappealing, and sometimes feels inferior to others. Yozo is also unusually reluctant to take personal risks or to engage in any new activities that may prove embarrassing on his own merit, but will follow his friends in doing so. When exploring the anxiety experiences with Yozo, the therapist would inevitably identify the marked trauma symptoms Yozo expresses. Along with the anxiety issues, a therapist would innately probe into the significant traumas that cause the marked behaviors and feelings consistent with CPTSD. The next diagnosis we will review is the Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, or better known as CPTSD, a diagnosis when an individual experiences ongoing trauma that lasted for months or even to years, most often occurring in childhood, but not always the case. An individual suffering from CPTSD experiences the same symptoms of PTSD. However, CPTSD also includes identifiers such as having disoriented negative feelings about oneself and feeling permanently damaged. Yozo seems to have a passive sense of anxiety all of the time, from a childhood into his teen years and into his 20s. He is persistent of continuous negative emotional state, fear, guilt, and shame, masking these with his joke persona. He is persistent about expectations about oneself or others, I'll never make you happy type mentality. Yozo seems to be irritable and on edge through most of the novel. Yozo also has the persistent inability to experience positive emotions. He only mentions being happy one time in the novel. Many times throughout the novel, Yozo talks about his detachment or estrangement from others. You may find that your belief systems are affected including losing your faith and your sense of self which Yozo seems to go through multiple times. 
Yozo seems to have difficulty controlling his emotions, he seems to have trust issues, and this constant feeling of hopelessness or emptiness. Yozo also seems to avoid friendships and relationships unless they are imperative to helping keep up his mask or his persona of the jokester. And of course, we have the suicidal ideations or actions in the novel. Ultimately, keep in mind, we are working with an incomplete story, and the best we could hope for is possibly weekly sessions teaching Yozo therapeutic interventions to help cope with his anxious symptoms, trauma work, learn to regulate emotions, develop positive relationship skills, and possibly medication management. It is worth mentioning that if Yozo is indeed on the autism spectrum, it could have actually been what allowed him to be so successful as he was managing his life throughout the novel. The Mind of Yozo, a fictional diagnosis on a fictional character. So the first question we have is from our friend and for our friend Jack here, which is, is this a good first read for someone who wants to check out more Japanese literature? That's that's a great question, considering I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I do think it is. I think I, I don't know that I thought that the first time I read it, and I had read a number of other Japanese writers. I had been reading Japanese writers for close to twenty years at this point. Um, when I when I first encountered um, No Longer Human, but on a reread, I think there are elements of it that make it super accessible for someone who's never read a novel by a writer from Japan, doesn't necessarily have a deep background in Japanese culture, whether that's Japanese culture pre 20th century or Japanese culture in the 20th century. And so there are elements of it that make it super accessible. The fact that it's a first person narrator, the fact that there are elements of it that seem like deeply confessional, um, that's very comparable to the mainstream auto fiction that is just taking over bookshelves at Barnes and Noble, though not in my library. And, um, I think the other aspect is it taps into sort of universal human experiences and emotions. I think all of us at some point have felt lonely. All of us at some point have felt out of place. We've been the new kid uh, at the school. We've been the new kid in the class. We've been the new person at the job. Uh, we've been the new person in the apartment complex. And so that feeling of being lonely, feeling out of place, trying to figure out where we fit in and sort of questioning every decision we're making, every social interaction we're making is under this like personal microscope as it happens. Uh, it's something that feels very universal. And so there's an aspect to No Longer Human that I think so many readers can just associate with. And even though we may not feel those emotions as deeply as our narrator did, uh, we still have felt them. We, we have a level of empathy we can uh, generate within No Longer Human. And so I think it's a great introduction to Japanese literature in the 20th century. And I would add that the, the deep influence of other Japanese writers, specifically Runuke Akutagawa, um, is evident in No Longer Human. And so that serves as sort of just this natural gateway for your next read. Yeah, so I I will be honest up front, I have very limited, my, my pool of knowledge is much smaller. Uh, however, so I agree and disagree. Um, I I think that this is a good accessibility. But what I struggle with is what makes this uniqueness, what gives this this the Japanese flavor to have that regard of this is a good entry for somebody getting into Japanese literature. Because as I read the story, do me wrong, this is a 10 out of 10. Uh, right off the bat, this is by far my favorite Japanese anything that I've read so far and I've loved everything we've done but this is just so amazing for all the points that you just brought up uh it, it is so relatable but what makes this uniquely Japanese I don't know uh because I look at it of if you replaced uh Desai's name with Faulkner and you replaced Yozo with Bob it feels like it is just so people it's just so us as humans and i struggle to see the uniqueness of its japanese background because it was so accessible so i'm kind of on the fence of a yes and no answer uh, and that's why i would love to kind of discuss the book more of what did i miss in this first read through as a first time reader and uh i i want to go back and read through the the, the story again after our discussion and our talks and our videos because i want to look at it with a uh an educated pair of eyes. Yeah. 
when we talk about what makes something Japanese, it's a hard question to answer because you have so many different walks of life when it comes to authors and how they write. You, you can't say this is the, the quintessential American book because there's so many different viewpoints and experiences when it comes to being an American. And it's going to be the same thing for Japan too. When we look at Dazai, it's no shock or surprise. You know that it's going to be pessimistic. You know it's going to be borderline <laughs> nihilistic. There's going to be a sense of alienation to it. And I wouldn't say those are necessarily the characteristics of Japanese literature for sure. But what is very prevalent in a lot of Japanese writings are the exploration of the self, the exploration of the self against society or even nature, and the way that there's like some reoccurring themes that kind of keep popping up. And the story tenders, tends to just kind of meander, right? Like we don't have a, it's not just a straight introduction, cl rising action, climax, falling action stories when it comes to Japan. It's it's more about the integration of life in, in humanity and in nature. And then maybe even a little bit of, um, when I think about Japan, they explore themes of kind of like, I want to say a person's harmony with the world while... Well, Americans tend to be a little bit more on the individualistic side, like the, the freedoms and the self-expression. And Japan's about that self-expression in the context of society, in a sense. And that might be a little bit unfair, a little bit more of a broad stroke comment. But I think we see some of those with Dazai's writing in terms of how Yozo is trying to define himself against society. And he's having a hard time defining it. He's having a hard time defining even himself the individual and how should he be represented in this world, that there's still that flavor that we get. So is it the best introduction to Japanese literature? I don't know. It's, it's definitely dark. It's definitely not the main pick, pick me up, feel good read that you would tell someone to be like, Oh, you're going on a, you want a summer read to, to kick off that, that the summer vacation. This, this might not be it, but it does have uh, some great elements of the Japanese literature built into it. So do you think one of those elements is sort of the classic concept of the I novel within mm. Japan? And I guess that would be a good thing to define, like what is the I novel, like the Watakushi right. Shosetsu. It, it's, it's hard for me to define because when I first started reading Japanese literature is because I was taking it in college. It was a minor of mine and it was an interest. And that's actually, you know, how I got started in the professional world. Like, oh, you speak Japanese. We have a Japanese affiliate and we want to hire you to potentially help us, you know, speak with them and such. So, so I was on a different life path with, with just, this is cool. Let's learn this language. This is fun. So I wouldn't say I, I learned it at the level of, of classification. And I know that's where you excel, Jack. Like when you make videos, you're amazing at being like, oh, it reminds me of this author. It has the, the elements of this type of genre in it. And you're really good at connecting the dots between these. And I'm terrible at that. So when I learned what is the I novel, oh, it's a story where the author conflates himself with the main character almost. It's an exploration of himself, of feelings, and of emotions more so than worrying about plot or external circumstances. It's the definition of the self as opposed to the, the external. So when I learned that, I, the first time I had read No Longer Human a long time ago, didn't even know what an eye novel was. It, it was just mind-blowing to see so many elements that, that I saw in myself about how I sometimes struggle relating to others, particularly as an introvert, particularly as a very shy individual growing up and analyzing myself from the perspective of inferiority of like, I don't belong here. This, these people are looking at me strange. They know that I don't belong here. It, it's a, it's a strange way of being seen in, in a book in a way that I don't think Dazai makes Yozo the fool, but he definitely makes his plight aware to him, if that makes sense. So for me, the I novel was an experience because it was so real. The author knew these shoes that we were walking in before I even knew it as a genre, that it was really cool to kind of just step into. And I think that's what I novels bring to the table is that deeply personal experience to a reader. No, I agree 100%. I, 
I, I sometimes think of the I novel as sometimes it's it's very autobiographical. And I think there are elements of No Longer Human that are super autobiographical, but it doesn't have to be strictly autobiographical. I think the way you describe the the blend, this fusion of actual authorial self and character, first person narrator within the novel, this blend that can be totally fused into one individual and it's purely autobiographical versus the way that blend can sort of pull apart. And there can almost be this imagined self this sense of this is who I could have been. Um, I think, and, th and I think there are actually some elements of that no longer human. Some of the ways that Yozo talks about really desiring to be an artist and, and there, there are elements of like being a, an activist student um, or, or some of the relationships that he, he describes that seem to be very autobiographical, but there are other elements. And I think this is something that makes the, the I novel a, a unique experience when, when you, when we read uh, more deeply within that, that sort of, subgenre is the way that, that that it can pull apart and you get this like almost alternate parallel version of the author imagining himself or herself and who who I could have been who could I have been if I had had uh children instead of not being a parent or who could I have been if I never had children even though I do have children and the way that that is explored uh is something that I think a lot of us reflect on sort of the whole road not taken um imagination that, that, that we'll have, it, you know, in our reflections or around how we view ourselves is something that uh, I, f I find very interesting and powerful within that, that subgenre. And I think no longer human is viscerally powerful as an example. I feel what this novel did with identity is crucial to understanding, I think, who Desai was and Yozo, uh, that all of us struggle with our real self versus our ideal self that who am I as a person and who does society view me as? And society is a lot of things because you're a father, you're a husband, you're a friend, you're a YouTube star. You're all of these things, but yeah, well, you too. I don't know about myself, <laughs> <laughs> but to somebody you might be, you know, and, 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 and we, we do what you guys did exactly what Yozo does, right? Because we're self-deprecating and you immediately went negative, right? You immediately went pessimistic. We do that as humans and it helps us cope. We joke about things because it's hard to accept the realities of life that if I get a taste of too much positive, will that alter my true self? Will that change who I am? Can I accept that different self? And I think that's what Yozo struggles with a lot through the novel and maybe Desai himself of identifying of who am I going to be and who am I going to be to society? Well, and I think you raise a really interesting idea there with the, the concept of the ideal self. And I think um, there are ways in which we all, I think most of us have experienced what, what sometimes is referred to as imposter syndrome. This idea of like, I don't know if I'm actually doing the right thing or if I'm good enough to do this. And I'm really worried that everybody else knows I'm not as good as I think I am at this and they're all going to catch me. And we have that, that sense of um, that, that sense of fear that we have in our social interactions. But there's, there's often when we use the term ideal self, we, we think of authors who create uh, false versions of themselves that are so much better. They're smarter, mm -hmm. wittier, uh, more clever, uh, braver, than they necessarily are. Um, I think sometimes we, we, we have writers who perhaps Ernest Hemingway is an example of that. His ideal <laughs> self is in some ways, I don't, I don't want to you know, take any shots, but someone who, who <laughs> especially early on, his ideal self is, you know, a very All specific the time. type of person, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. Is tougher and just can deal with it. Um, and experiences nature in all its totality. But there's this other side of the ideal self. There are individuals who have an ideal self that is actually, I don't want to say worse, but is less clever, is less negative aspects of, of oneself are accentuated in the imagined ideal self. And I think No Longer Human is perhaps one of the best examples of that. I think when, so here's, here's what I struggle with when it comes to Yozo, is his, we keep talking about him and then there's society. Right. It, it, there, there's this line that's drawn almost where is it is it a reason that he doesn't want to fit in? Like like you talk about with this imposter syndrome, that there's something that 
about him of, of why does he reject society so much? And I'm sure there's lots of psychology details here. For me, I kept focusing in on like the philosophy side of things of like, what is Yozo's philosophy? Like what, what is important to him? Cause I think that's something that a lot of people are like, what's driving this man? Like, why does he feel so empty and so lonely? And, and you know, you have these, these questions of is, is he an nihilist? Right. Which is a very Western term, right? Like when we look at Buddhism and then Sunyata and a lot of these terms about how, you know, things are impermanent and switch between states. It's hard to know what exactly does I was thinking, but I can tell you from a reader's perspective, who's a Western reader, and I admit that, I see nihilism in this piece one year ago. The way that, you know, when he sees the pillowcases and he sees the, the bridge, they're beautiful. I love these things. But as soon as he crosses that self into society and society has a purpose, a meaning behind it, it's almost like his nihilistic side takes over. And he's like, well, I hate bridges now. I hate pillowcases because they have a purpose. And, and you guys brought up a really good point earlier. Man, there's so many points to discuss here. You guys brought up that point about there's different levels of society, right? You've got society as a whole, which he's just like, okay, I don't want nothing to do with that, right? Like I want to be, I want to be the man on my own because I don't want purpose. I think if he thinks, you know, he associates himself with society, but there's these strange relationships that both he and, and Desire as an author and person went through in terms of his relationships with actual women in real life. And if he truly was a nihilist, what's, what's, what's happening here? What's this meaning in these relationships? Cause he does seem to try to push for happiness. He pushes for a purpose and maybe even a schedule, a pattern that he goes through once he's in the motions of being, you know, a husband or whatever. That it, it almost makes me kind of question, is he really like that? Because he says that he does find some happiness and some love at some point in times. And it's kind of, it's not that nihilists can't find that. Obviously, I think nihilism gets kind of a bad rap sometimes. But, but at the same time, the fact that anytime he sees purpose or meaning, he's got to pull away, right? Like, like what, what is going on here? Like, what are your guys' views on the way that every time something means something, uh, when the father wants him to define what he wants, like a mask or, or a book or whatever. He, he almost has this strange inner conflict that he can't resolve with the outside world. I think a lot of his uh, social anxiety is what he'd be diagnosed at today stems from kind of a, a broken childhood in the regards that he didn't have a lot of social interaction as a child. He was sickly. He missed a lot of school. Um, and again, maybe that's the difference of a Western upbringing versus a Japanese upbringing is I went to school and I made friends and learned how to interact and I learned how those friendships worked and he didn't have that. And so throughout the rest of his life, he doesn't know how to define these relationships and they're disposable, um, because he doesn't know the definition of a long lasting relationship. Uh, and, and, and then he has such a large family. Uh, there's what, 10 children. I mean, how can you get adequate upbringing love? I don't know. I mean, that, that, that's a lot of people to take care of. Um, I don't have any children. I couldn't imagine having just one child, like having to give all of my focus to them. Would that even be enough? And having to divide that 10 ways, is that possible to be able to, to do for Yozo? I don't know. I, I think there's a couple of ideas here. You know, to, to respond to the the nihilism, I think we sometimes view, and, and perhaps this is from a highly consumer uh, culture materialist view that we have in in the U.S. and in other you know in European countries, that um, nothingness is terrifying. It, it, nothingness is is the the opposite of consumption. If you if you, if you have nothing, you have nothing left. You have you know we 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 so often uh, will will share news about our possessions, and so this idea of of nothing and of nothing and nihilism is not necessarily nothingness, but this idea of nihilism and the view that that nothingness um, is to be feared. It's almost this abyssal void uh, from which it's like once you've fallen into that, it, it's over. 
and there's no return. It's just this, it's the final period and it's, it's gone. Um, and that is, that is something that induces a lot of fear, I think, for, for a lot of folks, um, for, for a variety of reasons. And there's this other idea of nothingness that uh, not, you know, um, simply in, in other cultures, but, uh, or in Asian cultures, but there is this idea of nothingness, uh, where nothingness is the sort of place from which new beginnings emerge. And so, so sometimes this concept of, of the void or of an ending is rather just the, the beginning of a new regeneration. And I don't think, and so th that sense of endings or of, um, of, uh, of an ending that's not nihilistic, but that deals with emptiness and, you know, loss is not necessarily something to be feared. And yet here, it feels like it's much closer to that, that, that sense of void, ending, abyssal, fear, like the, sort of the Western definition of nothingness and nihilism, uh, much more than what we might find in, in, um, in other works from different cultures or from Japanese writers. And I think that's, uh, that's part of what makes it something that, you know, folks who, as I said, don't have a lot of background in Japanese literature or 20th century Japanese culture can read. I think Desai had, in his schooling, um, growing up in a wealthy family, had been exposed to a lot of Western ideas, Western literature, you know, European literature, um, European philosophy. And so he he sort of had, had experienced a lot of these ideas as a very young person. Oh, absolutely. And you, in sometimes I'll, I'll peruse various like posts from people, right? Like I want to understand from a nihilist, like what, what is your view? And you'll see these questionnaires where people will say, I'm not a nihilist. Explain to me, isn't it terrifying thinking that, that this is meaningless? Like, like how do you, how do you find value in going on? And it's interesting when you see those reviews and, and responses where people say it's liberating. I don't have to live to any specific standard. There's no, goal in the sense of success or not. Like I get to define for myself what, what's going to happen from here. And that's actually a really good point you bring about Eastern versus Western thinking too, is that there, there's a lot more ideas of nothingness is actually good <laughs> when it comes yeah. to Zen, Zenism, Buddhism, stuff like that. Like the, like the idea of that being freeing, the escape of life is suffering is that nirvana, that emptiness in a sense sometimes. And you can even see that too with some of the thinking when we've talked about like, you know, like that self-annihilation, like that's considered shameful to Americans. Like that's like considered awful. And I think it's not that it's not awful for others, but there's much different meaning in the Japanese culture in the sense of the restoring honor to the family for wrongdoings and stuff like that. And did, did Yozo feel that self-annihilation was a right for, I think he viewed his life as wrong a lot of the times. I, I think he felt that he was failing to achieve something and the fact that he was so alienated from society that he was incorrect compared to the rest. Uh, a lot, I've seen a lot of reviews on this book and for some reason, a lot of people seem to respond positively to the Donald Keene introduction where he talks about how this book is called no longer human as printed, but a better translation to him is that, well, it should be called disqualified from being human. And the, the, the kaku, like the, that there's four kanji, the, the last kanji is kaku, that's like a qualification. And that could be a fail for a qualification for a job, for a test, uh, or even seen it used for like failure as a husband. Like it's you failed to meet these standards. And so if we think about like, what's the kaku represent for Yozo? And it's like, is, is kaku like the qualification of you do these things and you're a part of society and Yozo is failing to meet those? I think that's probably where you get a lot of that emotional resonance because then that implies that you have to do something to be accepted by society, which means that your, your standards of living are defined by someone else. You're not free in the nihilistic view of, of nothingness. You do have standards, qualifications you have to meet in order to fit in with others. If you are embracing nihilism as kind of we're speculating that Yozo has to some extent, it's interesting that we kind of bring up the idea of materialism and Westernism because if that's sprinkled in by Desai into Yozo, 
what does what does he do through his life? He's always trying to find pleasure, right? He's always trying to fill that void, fill that emptiness that he feels he has in his life with trying to please his father when he's young, going to school and trying to fit in when he's trying to become the artist, uh, filling it with uh, prostitutes and booze, etc. He's always trying to fill that void that he doesn't seem to want to recognize is there. And I wonder if that's part of what we learn as we grow older. Um, you had mentioned, you know, uh, desire learning this at a young age, being westernized to some extent. Is that Yozo going through this series of events that a lot of us go through as, as young people and then teenagers and then into our 20s and, and then into middle age? Uh, it, it almost is a perfect scenario for life. And I, I think that kind of brings us back to what we said at the beginning of why this is so relatable to so many of us is, are we trying to fill that void with, you know, some type of substance or a religion or lack thereof or family or a job or whatever? It just seems to be that he's doing that over and over and over again and failing because he, he doesn't know how to do that. And that frustrates him. Well, and, and I think you're onto something, Crypto. I think he shares that story about the, you know, the dad asking, what gift do you want um, very early on? And that's a big cue because he doesn't want the lion mask. Like he, he emphatically does not want that. And yet he feels shame or guilt or, or some impulse to sneak down at night where no, when no one can see him and to take it out and write out that, you know, a lion mask next to his name and then go off back to bed. And he, he won't do it in front of anybody, but he, he goes and, you know, tries to fulfill some obligation. And I think um, there's almost a sense of him putting that out as this signal of like the rest of my life has been me going out and trying to write lion mask down in someone's memory of, of their experience with me, whether it is a, you know, a parent, who expects me to join the civil service, whether it is an older sibling who expects me to take on some role for the family, whether it is, you know, uh, a, a woman I meet at a cafe and I strike up some type of relationship with, and I think, okay, this is, this is the way this needs to progress. Um, that he's constantly throughout his life going in and writing lion mask down uh, and, and trying to like imprint that, you know, he's, whether it's when he's in school, he's writing class clown down in everybody's memory. And the way that he periodically realizes, wait a second, because because there's a, there's a, another side to that is they're all seeing through me. Every time I'm writing down line mask, every time I'm writing class, class clown down, my dad saw the line mask and thought it was just you know very funny, uh, and and he he you know thought oh gosh he must have really wanted it, and so I duped my dad. But then when he has the friend who catches him out and is mm -hmm. like you did that on purpose, and just yeah, the, the terror bars. that overwhelms him. Right. The terror that overwhelms him, that that's sort of this cue of like, hey, I'm going to be constantly going in and trying to like pose and, and put up the put up the facade that you want. And, and the idea of the fact that it's a mask specifically, I think is very hmm. symbolic. Um, and so for, for that to be, you know, the, the first idea and then or later on, he's caught out on it and suddenly he has that fear of, wait a second, every time I'm trying to put this mask on. What if they're actually seeing through me? What if they actually know that I, as Una said, have been disqualified? That, in fact, not only have I been disqualified, but I was never even really qualified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that everybody was seeing through him except for, and I'm not even going to pronounce his name and embarrass myself. Um, Takeshi? Ho Hoyotso. What? Horiki? Is it? Horiki, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because they seems to be the only one, and his uncle later in the story, they, those seem to be the two that that can see through the mask and see the true Yozo. Do you think that everybody else could see it, and they were just placating him? Because I don't think they did. He may have thought they did, but I think those were the only two that truly saw the real him, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you're spot on, and I think that's part of what makes the book so tragic is that mm -hmm. we as readers are probably thinking, you know what, people, people pull this over us all the time. <laughs> I, it, like crypto, we, we have students who pull this over us 
all the time. <laughs> we have colleagues who do who do this. Uh, we have family members. You know, we, we know that that we've been able to to pull off things, and so uh, I think that's part of the tragedy is that Yozo is terrified of this, and yet so he he has been so successful throughout the novel in in you know perpetuating this this fictional version of himself, this imaginative version of himself. And um, I wonder what it was like for Desai, you know, at, at what points did, did and that that's part of what's tough, right? Is is we know how Desai's life ended. We know um, the, the parallels that existed within No Longer Human in his own life, uh, but we don't, we don't know what, what he thought or how he felt. We don't know um, if he was constantly fearing that he was not acting a certain way or was not behaving a certain way and if he feared the way that others perceived him um and we don't know how well or how poorly he deceived anyone else we've talked about before una uh, about kind of and I, I think you hinted at this before of faking it until you make it do you think that yozo slash desai is doing that i mean because we all talk about that like that first year i remember teaching i didn't know anything i was doing and i was like i'm just gonna pretend and hopefully they believe that this is how things go and a lot of times we do that maybe like the first year you have your kid i have no clue how to be a parent i'm just gonna go with it and i feel that i feel that this is a lot of the 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 rule book for life or, or the guide for life is you fake it until you make it and yozo is doing just that but isn't that also what alienates him too as soon as he finds out that there's something he ought to do, something that he should do, that that's when he's immediately repulsed by it. The the idea that, you know, you mentioned, I think, materialism earlier, I think more in the sense of, of the economic sense of the world, but there's also the philosophical sense of the world of materialism, of there is nothing more to this. To this. It's, we're all just atoms in this life. And doesn't that align better that there's not a, a greater ulterior motive that he could just be and stop having to try to placate and, and do this dance of society? And that's what makes, I think that's what, okay, there's a, there's, there's this anime called Bungo Stray Dogs. And it's actually really cool because it's great that there is different forms of media that can attract people to literature, right? And in this anime, they have tons of characters that are literary giants. So you've got like a character named Dostoevsky. You got a character <laughs> named, you know, Kawabata and stuff like that. Well, there's there's a Dazai character. And, and I love this one quote that I think came from that. But it said, Dazai, tell me why it is that you think you should end this. And he's talking about, you know, the self-annihilation there. And he says, let me turn that around. What makes life worth living? And I think that's the hardest part for Yozo is that it's not to fit into society. It's not that there's a greater purpose or meaning. He really is a materialist. And I think that's probably, I know he was running chores for the Marxist group, you know, which is something that, does, you know, to the autobiographical side and I novel side of things, that is something Desai fell into momentarily. But isn't that why he was probably falling into that group easily? Because as a materialist, his values better align with communism probably than a lot of other people in that group. Uh, he was probably a better communist, but even he himself thought it was kind of ridiculous that we're all running around with this facade of defining what our purpose and value should be. When to him, he's just like, "This is, this is silly. Like, there's there's no point to this." Yeah, I, I don't think he had a significant view on who controlled the means of production. No. <laughs> Well, I would also point out the fact that when you say, what is the point of all of this? What, what do you both as fathers define as the point of all of it? Your relationship with your children? I mean, you've procreated the species. You've continued on the next generation. Don't a lot of us define our lives by the relationships we have? And for Yozo, that's tough. He has all these broken relationships that has been pointed out many times tonight that seems to reset every couple of years. Mm. Uh, I don't know if he defines himself by materialism or if he does, he doesn't understand that 
materialism is obviously not working for him and that he could try something else, but maybe he's too afraid to do that. Uh, maybe he's afraid of failure or maybe he's afraid of success. I mean, some people are terrified of getting what they want. When you finally meet your hero, when you finally get the person you love and they don't meet those expectations, what then? And maybe that's where Yozo is at is if I achieve happiness, what does that look like for me? And is that something I would even want to have? Because I don't know if he does. Not to say that he's one of those, I'll be happy in my misery, but he he rarely looks for positivity. I think he doesn't want to dress it up, right? So, so Jack, you've read the Friday Black Collection by Nanakwami Ajay Brinya. There's that yeah. era story in there. And if you remember in there, there's the turn. As soon as humans started telling the truth and we stopped dressing up what we think, like, like we just tell people if they're stupid, we tell them they're stupid. If they're mm-hmm. saying something we're annoyed with, we just tell them we want to kill them with a rock, right? It's that idea that, that once you strip away the niceties and a lot of the social complexities that you learn growing up, cause you know, like kids, they'll say something like, wow, look how fat that kid is. And you're just like, dude, you can't say that. And he's like, what do you mean? I right. can't say that. Right? Like, like when you're raising a child, there's all these silly games that you have to teach them of what does it mean to be a part of society? And, and what does it mean to think about others as, as they're growing up? And I think that's one of the things that, Yozo never understood to, to your earlier point about the father. He never got the approval or success that he wanted with him unless he was specifically not being himself, but playing the game of, I will buy the mask to your point about the symbolic element of, I will dress up my life as opposed to being my real self to your point crypto about who I really am. I, I always go back to the scene in the diner when the infamous kiss is going to happen Yozo is jealous, and that is a raw human emotion. Mm-hmm. And and I always go back to that, and I think, does he really care? Mm. Does Is he finally in touch with himself? Is he having a human connection? Because I feel like, I know je- jealousy is usually seen as a negative, right? But if you genuinely cared about somebody, and somebody's, in, quote, infringing on your territory then that's showing your genuine self. And and I, I just I always go back to that scene in the diner uh, era of the restaurant or whatever of, of when the waitress is going to get the kiss who he has the relationship with and he's mad that his friend is going to kiss this girl that he potentially likes. Like, doesn't that show that he really does have these relationships, that he really does care, that, that he isn't so devoid that we've painted him as this nihilistic heartless psychopath like it, it, it he's a conundrum he, he he's this oxymoron it, it, it and i and i think that's why this novel is, is is such a 10 out of 10 is because you can go so many ways with it and see yourself in yozo in every single scene when he is being such a different person over and over and over again and i think that's also part of like what's kind of illuminating to me too is it's so easy to sympathize in some in some parts of the novel, and and I th- I thought that was a hostess club. I'm just saying that's a much different place than a diner if it was, but I don't know, uh, and I also don't know what hostess clubs were like in the '60s, but <laughs> but um the, the, the '30s, the 1930s. Oh, sorry, 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 '30s. Um, but when when um when we look at that scene, I also wondered. How much of this was when when it was Horiki that was with him at the time, right? And Horiki's yes. like, oh, I would never yeah. kiss someone that pov- poverty stricken. <clears throat> like there's some element about that too and how him saying uh, that was Suneko, right? So he's just like, man, that's the only woman that I ever loved. And for him to suddenly have someone say that there's, there's, there's no, there's a, there's a cast on her. I think that weighed on him more even than her turning him down almost. The the judgment that came with it almost kind of influenced his his thought process there. So I'd ask Jack then real quick to, to comment on that in regards of is this that Japanese element of early 20th century Japan where it's cla- class, caste, economy – how does that define 
what we're seeing the interaction of these characters i don't know that that is i i don't know how much of that is illuminated within the book um this is a really interesting time you know there the the sort of very small communist movement in japan this was pretty effectively suppressed um there's been this element of you know there's been this element of um Western ideas, uh, Western literature, Western ways of, of wearing clothing that are now popping up. And there's another writer, um, Junichiro Tan uh, Tanazaki, whose book, Some Prefer Nettles, really focuses on that, where there's sort of two generations and they're looking at going to puppet theaters, going to see like, like, like characters who are very explicitly trying to dress in a classically Japanese way, trying to appreciate and be patrons of classical Japanese arts. Um, and, and then that that like contrast is super clearly illuminated. It's 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 a beautiful novel. It's one of my favorite novels, um, but that's not necessarily fleshed out here. And I think that was something you noted early on, crypto, is that it's not fleshed out. The importance of the civil service is sort of fleshed out more, more clearly, I think, than any class systems that existed. The, the, the communist movement was simply something Yoza was not supposed to be part of. No child, son or daughter from an affluent family that was part of the existing government was supposed to be part of that. And that frankly would have been the same in Germany. It would have been the same in the U S uh, it, it would have been the same in, in most countries that had some level of industry uh, that, that type of choice, you know, to be viewed as anti-establishment would have been viewed with scorn, contempt, uh, disgrace. Um, what's interesting is you raised that idea about, you know, the jealousy that he feels and there's the, cliche to dodge about the opposite of love is not hate it's apathy and so that that jealousy any emotion seems to be a very human experience um, and i think one of the questions i have and it's not something i fully answered on this reread is does yozo i don't think i don't think he views himself as part of his family and that he has disgraced his family in such a way that any form of self-annihilation restores honor to his family he's not part of the family as a self, he, because he's not part of the family, he, he cannot restore any honor to it. And so I don't think he makes any choices from that, uh, from that, that mindset. But is there a way in which he rejects his own humanity within the course of the novel? And that's not something I was fully able to decide this. And that was something I was, I was, I was like asking myself as I was reading through particularly as mm -hmm. I got into the third notebook was, okay, is kind of knowing where this goes, is he rejecting his own humanity by the end of the book? Yeah. And I couldn't quite decide on that. Yeah, that that, the, that question even kind of echoes a little bit of uh, Ryunosuke Akutagawa's writings too, right? He's got that uh, story health screen about like mm -hmm. what makes us humanity in terms of compassion. And you can see that with Desai's writing here too, I think. Um, I think there's, when, if we don't have humanity, what are we? Are we animals? Are we animalistic, right? And there's a couple of parts in the story that I remember kind of, I don't know if I was attacking it from the same, ang same angle, but you have the opening scene when he's seen with the mask and they describe him almost like a monkey-like grin, right? Almost like, like he's an animal just carnalistically, that's not a word, but he's, he's reacting to kind of like the scene and he's, he's uncomfortable. And then you have a very definitional scene when his wife is taken advantage of and his friends just like, you need to come see this. I'm going to go. And it's, it's very abstract the way that Desai decides to describe a lot of trauma in this novel. And that scene was where he sees his wife being attacked and he's just describes it. I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something along the lines of animalistic behavior, right? The idea that once we take away society's rules and laws and we just resort back to our desires and just doing what we actually want to do, there's something about how Yozo sees it, right? And he just he doesn't judge it because he doesn't have those moralistic standards that society has imprinted upon him. And I, and I know crypto, you're, you're probably biting your lip here. You're ready to go into the acceptance of him versus father, right? Like the idea that that he I, let me let me turn it over to you, crypto, because I'm sure when it comes to that question about from from Jack here, you kind of want to talk about that. Uh, two things, two things. Yes. Uh, 
let's let's talk about dad in a second. Uh, I know we all got daddy <laughs> issues, um, but uh, with with the violation of his wife, um, he's almost blaming her. Uh, I felt like it was the crux of the whole book that really shows that he has turned on his back on his own humanity to answer your question, Jack, um, because he almost blames her. And he almost says it's the right of the husband to blame the wife and leave the wife because she let this happen to her. Um, I don't remember the exact in there, but it, it's something to that effect. And it, it, it's very sexist. And it's like, Whoa, Yozo, like no empathy for your wife. Like, you're blaming her almost like that. And again, maybe that was early 19th century's world culture. I mean, very different than 2023 when we're recording this. Um, but it, it it did feel like kind of a, a shock that he had no sympathy, empathy whatsoever. Uh, and that he was just kind of like, yeah, maybe I should kind of get rid of my wife like, and move on because she allowed this to happen. Uh and, and and then that kind of brings it back to the crux of all his relationships are broken because it all starts with his father. His original strongest bond, his relationship with his father is broken from a young age. And it comes back to what you said, Jack. He couldn't be his true self to his father when he tried and said he didn't want that damn mask. And his father and his mom kind of poked fun at him. And it was like, like you want the mask. <laughs> and he's like do i and his brother's like you do and he's like uh i don't know and then he has to lie and sneak back in and say he wants the mask like that sets his path for all the rest of his life to be set up with these failured relationships and lies yeah and i would i would want to even respond to your comment too because i've seen it come up before where some people are wondering about yozo's treatment towards women right like is he a misogynist and that sort of thing and here's an interesting thing. So we as English readers don't have access to his entire Uber, right? Like there's tons of untranslated mm -hmm. design. I'd love to read more flowers of buffoonery is coming out soon. And we want to read that. Right. But apparently he's written like, I think like four novels, four works, at least from the point of view where the, the, the novels narrator is a woman. And part of what the, the theory, the critique is that, he uses these these male and women to critique each other the way that when when he is being negative towards women it's actually a critique upon himself of of the things that he's failing to provide and bring to the table mm. and i guess some of uh you know some critics have pointed out that a lot of his women tend to be the stronger in terms of the the home values and and the work ethic and stuff like that as opposed to the men failing to be the utilitarian providers that they're expected to be in a patriarchal japan it's 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 very complex but the theory is that the gender relations are critiques reflected off each other on themselves. That's interesting. I think Yozo in some ways is definitely an idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, as much as we want to, that there's a strong tendency to want to read just Desai's autobiography in, or his biography into the character of Yozo. But there, there are differences. Um, <laughs> there, 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 are, there, are, there are differences in, in where they exist. That those are almost like really important differences. Um, and so the, the, the idea that Yozo does represent something, that, that Yozo is not necessarily quite to Zai is, is critical. Um, and that this isn't an art versus artist conversation, but, but I think he, I, I, th I think that's one thing to, to note is as much as we want to read his biography into that character, into the character he created, in part because we now know with the Flowers of Buffoonery coming out, that this is a character he had spent some time developing. Um, you know, that, that this isn't quite, you know, his own expression of himself uh, as, as his true self or, or authentic self necessarily. Uh, this, this is a character and that this is a character who's an idea. Um, what, what one thing that I think is interesting is that there is, there is an element of the, the idea of self-annihilation of, of how Desai's life ended that I think, and, and the fact that like the, the, like he he died right around the time that right the final installment of No Longer Human was being 
like published and serialized. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And so there's this tendency to want to say like, look, like he was basically writing this, this as his last work of sort of, Hey, this is how it's all going to end. Like here, here's where I'm at. This is my mental state right now. This is, this is where, where I'm going and this is over. Um, But there's also an element that, that suggests that perhaps he wasn't even the person who initiated uh, uh, the double suicide that he was part of. And that um, it was it was his his uh, partner at the time who who you know had sort of made that choice and he chose to go along, and so that 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 idea of of is Yozo rejecting his humanity was Desai rejecting his own humanity I think is is a little more uh, enigmatic it's it's a little bit tougher to answer for sure than I think sometimes we want to simplify these things because we we like narratives we like stories. Yeah. And we like we like things all to be you know perfectly you know beginning middle and end, and right. with with Yozo we kind of almost get that Desai we really don't uh, you know we can't truly see in the mind of him, um, and and it brings me back to the title of the of the novel right is no longer human, and it brings back to our point before of. What is a human? Does Yozo see himself as that? Does Desai see himself as that? Well, if you're no longer human, and if the translation is correct, that means you were human and you are no longer human. So how did you lose your humanity? Is this story about Yozo having it and losing it or never having it at all? Well, and the disqualifying you know, disqualified human in some sense gets at the idea. Like if, if crypto, you and I were going to be take our first initial certification to be teachers and we failed the test, were we ever certified as teachers? If, if, if we not. don't pass our qualification, no, we're, we're not certified. So I, I think there's some level of, you know, asking, I do read human emotions in the character personally, but I think there's a way in which maybe, you know, if, it, has he failed the test to show that he was a human and uh, so, so he's no longer pretending to be human. So the determining factor of who decides back to your question, that if we pass that test, if we're a teacher who makes that decision society, again, it comes all back full circle of those relationships, those society, those masks of how we're viewed of as a human because of what our fellow people say about us of being a human, because maybe I view it differently than you, uh, my religion, my nihilism, my status, my class, my, my values, uh, or, or my relationships of being a father. I, I don't have kids. Am I a human? <laughs> let, me, let me leave one little thought here. When we talk about the, the translation of that title, the disqualification, you know, not failing to meet the qualities of, that, that first part, the ningen, it's made of two kanji. One is the kanji for person. And you'll see that all the time to describe a person, right? Like that's fairly straightforward. Well, that second kanji is kind of like space between. And I guess a long time ago, it was meant to describe groups of people. So you have the person and then you have the groups of people, society, and the failure to be qualified for that. And I think there's more thought put into this title than just simply translating it to English can allow us to even understand how even over time, the definition of society almost even kind of becoming like this space, the difference between us and mashing these together. It's interesting to see how over time, even our standards change. Do you think there's any, because I, I don't know, I don't think any of us have talked about this, but do you think there's any significance to the fact that this book is is written and, and published and serialized in the aftermath of world war ii in terms of the alienation the westernization being invited in in terms of the identity of who yeah. is japan and that sort of thing it's kind of like a meiji era part two except except right. you know you you always had these worries from the the japanese of of what does it mean to be japanese right first you had the right. meiji era of we have to change our way of living we're importing art. We're per importing these things called books. Well, what what's the Japanese way to express yourself? Well, now you have, you know, the the post 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 World War was interesting because you had Yukio Mishima, like you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that you had a lot of concern over what Japan should be in the future. Mm -hmm. It's almost 
less, less of a reflective of who are we and more of a, who are we going to be? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I think that that was a, Oh, go ahead. Crypto. I was going to comment real quick. Both of you look at it and take it from, because you are far more educated about this than I, from a Japanese perspective. Uh, and I have virtually nothing. So I look at it from my Western perspective of, of historical knowledge on post-World War II of this is, a, and we're only talking about this basically because it's a Japanese novel translated to English. Why would they do that? Because those were our enemies. Those were the people that we bombed and killed hundreds of thousands of people. So is this trying to right a wrong? Or is this trying to humanize a people that were our enemies to try to incorporate them back into our society saying, these are no longer our enemies. These are our allies now. Yeah. The, uh, what was it? The Formosan? No, not the Formosan declaration. The, uh, the U S Japan mutual defense pact came pretty quickly as the cold war set in very quickly. Yeah. Because I, I, mean, I want to say this is, this is mending fences, right? Hold on, hold <laughs> this on. Is, wasn't this? I feel like this book was translated in the 1950s, maybe even. Yeah, I think this book was translated in like 1958. 58. So yeah, so about 10 years. The after heart of the Cold War. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean that that's that, that could be very telling, you know, the of why mm-hmm. then, you know, and and again, as you just said, a flowers of buffoonery coming out. 70 years later i mean it, it's been he's been dead a hundred years and we're just now getting this that's mind-blowing to me so what you're saying is stay tuned <laughs> because coming up next we're gonna have to have a flowers of buffoonery talk is what part you're two saying. yeah there you go part full, two osamu Desai, full blossom <laughs> <laughs> i'll be human or er <laughs> Back when we were happy. No, wait, no, we were never happy. Let's be honest. <laughs> hey, we've been drinking. Yeah. We're very happy. Well, I am. B- b- buffoons with bassoons. We're all going to have to rent instruments for the... Uh... Mm. <laughs> Only Una plays. I don't play. I just look pretty. I'm your front man. Well, all right. Thank you so much for listening, joining us in on the journey. If you're this far, I, I hope you guys are liking and commenting, but please, I'm going to leave a link to Jack's channel down below as well for you to go check out his channel. Uh, he is far more eloquent and much more brief in his conversations than when he comes on here and we <laughs> extract hours and hours of discussion out of him. So appreciate you Thank guys you spending some us. time. Thank you, Jack. We Thank you, Jack. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Thus, we have reached the epilogue. Welcome back to the disembodied voice. This was supposed to be a 20 minute talk. At this point, I still feel like there's more to discuss with no longer human how the man's prophecy came true, the distorted view that we have of society with the cartoons that this man made for art. But I hope that at least we've given you some food for thought. And that's really what our channel's about. We're not supposed to be about answers. We're not supposed to be about giving you solutions. We're supposed to be about probing the questions and relating that back to our humanity. And I hope you've enjoyed us sharing our perspective on it. And that's perhaps the greatest gift this book can give is the ability to feel like there's someone out there to let you know that you're not alone. At this point, thank you for joining us on the journey. If you enjoyed this discussion and don't know what to add, even just leaving a little human emoji helps the video get seen and lets the algorithm know that you've enjoyed this video. We appreciate you spending time. Patreon, Ko-Fi links, other forms of support are always greatly appreciated. But most importantly, just thank you for spending some time to hear our view of this book. Peace.